May you live in interesting times. This is uh, often thought to be a curse put upon us, but we do live in interesting times. Energy security is rapidly moving to the forefront of every country's task list. West Texas is booming, North Dakota is booming, and our largest supplier of oil is now Canada. Things are changing all over. Traditional oil companies and small startups are developing new ways to turn what was once considered waste products into valuable synthetic diesel and jet fuels, each with their own unique chemistries. Uh, the, the, as we just said, the US uh, military has uh, always purchased commercial off-the-shelf engines uh, to power their vehicles, with some exceptions. And we're required to use the single battlefield fuel, JP-8, to power everything, both for uh, logistical reasons and for error reduction. You can imagine trying to run a, a vehicle on the wrong fuel, it just doesn't work. Uh, uh, the problem with JP-8 is it's, it's a jet fuel and our commercial engines are not truly designed to run on turbine fuel. Uh, so we've been developing synthetic fuels that will emulate this JP-8 and they still aren't exactly like diesel fuel. So we're trying to develop new ways uh, to, to make these fuels work better with our engines. One of the effects of running JP-8 is that you can see a decrease in performance of the engine. So it's up to us to figure out new methods and new ways to, to uh, new control strategies to make these engines run properly, that uh, they'll all be compatible with our engines. Uh, and in fact, new engines could be part of the future, we don't know. Uh, there could be a process by which uh, an engine can uh, self-correct for new fuels, different fuels, to restore power. Part of what we're doing here in this, in this thrust area is to develop surrogates that uh, can be used in CFD modeling. And, uh, that will give us a much better handle on the combustion process itself. Uh, and with that, really, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Violi, and she's gonna tell you everything that's been going on uh, lately. Okay, thank you, Eric, can you hear me? Good, yes, okay. So, um, welcome everybody. So, um, I'm going to introduce the first case study with a very long title. So any fuel, anytime, anywhere. I didn't choose the title. It was like systematic development of fuel surrogate to enable simulation-based engineering of omnivorous military engines. Okay. So the first thing I want to mention that this is a joint effort uh, between the University of Michigan and Wayne State University, and we have uh, five um, research groups working together. Um, two professors from Wayne State, Professor Renin, Professor Jensen, and three faculty from uh, the University of Michigan, um, Professor Bayman, Mart, and, uh, and myself. The two quad members are Dr. Eric Sadler, you just heard his comments, and Pete Shield will be talking um, at the end of uh, the last few minutes. We have also nine students involved in this project, and uh, um, they are here, and we are all excited to show you uh, some of those results. Now, drawing on the, what the comments that um, uh, Eric just had, I'm going to add an example to the problem that the Army is having, especially with the fuels. So think about um, dealing with missions in a desert, high temperature, uh, or in an environment in which the temperature is very, very low. What about if uh, the jet fuel is not available? What if we have to source fuels locally? So what we need is the Army be able to respond with the flexibility and still be capable to handle those situations. And so um, what can we do? There are two different approaches that we can take. One is using existing engines and trying to, to um, come up with the control strategies that can handle different fuels in different situations. The other one is that something that also Eric was mentioning is a, this a more a long-term approach is to develop fuel, uh, engines that are capable to adapt to different fuels. So, but both of those approach requires a lot of time. So from the moment we think about an idea and the moment that this engine gets to the market, for example, it takes a lot of time. And so um, here I'm reporting um, a real case from Cummins. Basically, in 2007, they were able to uh, deliver the first engine to the market, basing only their uh, study on modeling. 
So, and showing also the difference in terms of conventional time that will take, for example, um, a year here, compared with the modeling that can, um, in effect, cause a seven months reduction time uh, from the moment you start all the way to the moment that the engine gets to the market. So, drawing on those lines, we, um, in order to help the Harvey, our contribute for this case study is to develop modeling, uh, predictive models for uh, um, the simulation of engines with different fuels. Now, the first thing I want to mention is that what means predictive. Predictive means that the model is developed on specific experimental data, but is strong enough that can be extended to different conditions. So if I'm developing for low temperature, eventually I can also deal with high temperature environment in a desert. So if I want to do that, uh, fluid dynamics is the key here. And when you want to model an engine, there are a lot of inputs that you need to be um, taken care of. The first one is the fuel. What fuel are we dealing with? Is it JP8 or is it diesel? Or is it synthetic fuel? Then we need to describe the chemistry. So how do I take all those molecules, how they're going to behave in high temperature, high pressure engine conditions? And finally, you also want to constantly have some experimental uh, feedback in order to validate, but also to guide the model that you are putting together. So let's talk about the first part, the fuel. Um, Eric was mentioning jet fuels. Jet fuels is becoming the sole fuel that the army is using. But the problem with jet fuels is that it's composed of thousands of compounds. So it's not one molecule, but it is millions of those. So here is a gas chromatography showing the different compounds. And even if those peaks are little or tiny ones, they play a role when you look at the chemistry. And so um, the CFD simulations will be impossible to run if we take into account all thousand compounds. So the first thing we need to do is to simplify the system. And so going from thousand compounds to five, they somehow represent the key features of the fuels. And here comes into play the concept of surrogate. So let me show you a discrepancy between jet A, so a jet fuel uh, surrogate, and two of the synthetic fuels that Eric was mentioning derived from coal or uh, natural gas. Um, and so the problem is that those are examples of the molecules that are inside. The main striking difference is that if you do to synthetic fuels, there is no aromatics. You know, those two rings, one ring disappear. So the chemistry is going to change. The physics, the viscosity, the density is going to change. How those properties affect the engine uh, behavior? So we do need a surrogate that is able to be flexible enough to represent not only jet fuels, jet A, but also IPK and S8. So if I am in those conditions, then my model is able to uh, reproduce that. So I am uh, replace these figures. Instead of talking about fuel, I'm now talking about fuel surrogate. So our first goal is to develop a surrogate. So if I had to state the goal of our case study is to develop a JP8 surrogate, a model for JP8 surrogate capable of capturing not only the chemistry but also the physics that happens in an engine, and I'll show you the reason why you have to include both. And we, have, and we hope to have a predictive simulation for engines. So basically, t give me IPK in some condition, I can tell you how the engine is going to behave. Now, the first thing we need to do for a surrogate is try to understand what are the key properties that we are interested in. Engine is very complex, and this is just a cartoon, um, uh, you know, the showing the different processes that happen in an engine. And now I'm not going over all the details here, but I want to show you that there are physical properties. So the fuel comes in, is vaporized. So think about that. There is density, there is viscosity, there is vaporization, there is the molecular weight of the species. And then there is chemistry also. Eventually you have combustion. You form byproduct um, in different conditions of equivalence ratio, temperature. Not easy. So there are a list of properties that play an important role. What did we decide to do? The first thing I want to acknowledge is that in the literature there are already efforts going on for J jet P8 surrogate. And the three main uh, groups that have been working are the group in Germany, the Haken group, the MURI, that is an inter um, uh, interdisciplinary university research center, uh, and then something that was done in Utah. Let's look at the difference here. So if I, um, the surrogate that the Haken group developed in 2009 was mainly focusing on molecular weight of the species, hydrogen carbon, and uh, heating value. Three interesting properties. The MURI, that is a recent, I think the most recent jet fuel surrogate, is mainly focusing on molecular weight, hydrocarbons, uh, eating value and cetane number somehow. 
the Utah that actually I did many years ago was focusing on uh, only on distillation curve as suit tendency. Our goal was not an engine, so the property are different. What we are doing right now with this case study is basically try to cover all the key features of the engine. So looking at the chemistry as well as the uh, physics of the process. And so somehow we picked uh, property from all those uh, uh, four groups of uh, um, processes. And so the uh, framework that we develop for this is uh, going from the fuel, developing a surrogate, so a simplified model for the molecules. After that, going into the chemistry, so see how this molecule will break up eventually, how they behave at different temperature and pressure, and then plugged it into fluid dynamic code to produce engine simulations. Now, um, you will see um, a series of talks right now, and so uh, the first one is going to be Professor Renin from Wayne State. He will show you a simplified approach that still follows this flowchart and um, is derivation of a simplified surrogate. After that, Jason Martin will uh, come back, will come and talk about the details of the whole team um, to look at this framework. We'll start with solving a simple problem and find our way, and then we can decide on tackling difficult more problems. The easiest problem is to find a surrogate for a good quality JP8. In this case, we'll be able to also serve the industry because CT number of good, good JP8 is, is close to the JP8 of ultra low sulfur diesel fuel. So the simplified combustion mechanism can be applied for future military diesel engines and also in existing military diesel engines to achieve the targets of the, of the military. And also it can be used for commercial diesel engine operating on ultra low sulfur diesel fuel. The mechanism would replace N-heptane mechanism currently used in many diesel cycle simulation codes. It should be noted that N-heptane is a much lighter fuel than both uh, JP8 and ultra sulfur diesel fuel. The JP8 used in this investigation has 49 CTN number, and with some modifications, this mechanism can be applied for ultra low sulfur diesel used in commercial vehicles. Uh, this is the procedure and the milestones. Start with, first is to formulate a two component surrogate as you increase the number of components, the complexity of the problem increases, but we chose to have the simplest case, which two components surrogate that will match the physical properties and some chemical properties, and these are listed here on the top. The second is to validate the surrogate in, in the IQT at different temperatures. This will followed by validation of the surrogate in a single cylinder diesel engine. Finally, develop the mechanism, reduce it, put it in a 3D sim, uh, simulation code and compare the results of the predictions with the actual measurement in a single <coughs> cylinder engine. Here is uh, a sample of the matching of the physical chemical properties. In the table on uh, the left, uh, top left, you'll see the, the properties followed by the properties of JP8 and the properties of the surrogate. You see that there is a fairly good match and the top three uh, properties, but not as good in the uh, lower three properties. However, there is a good match also in the distillation curve, and you watch the distillation curve. The, the red is the JP8, and the orange is the surrogate. You see there is a fairly reasonable match in the load, in, in, in the uh, lighter component of the, of the fuel and surrogate and also, but this deviation increases as you go towards the heavy end. Uh, notice, look at the, the uh, saturation temperature of the N-heptane. It's much lower than the two uh, JP8 and the surrogate. This is why we felt that there, this need to be replaced by a two-component um, surrogate. Uh, 
this is the problem now, and we will refer to this later because you will see the effect of this variation as we go, uh, as we go into the comparison of the emissions. Uh, here is the results of the validation in the constant volume chamber of the IQT at temperatures varying from 505 to 575 degrees C. The bottom curve here you have the needle lift, and you see that the needle lift is fairly uh, reasonable, is, uh, the, the match is very good. If you go on to the top right, you see that the instantaneous rate of heat release, the matching is fairly good, and the, and the left hand side here, which is here when the temperature is high, because the injection, uh, because the temperature is fairly high, 575. If you go to the lower temperature, you find that there is some deviation, but still it is acceptable as being a uh, good uh, simulation. The same uh, phenomena can be uh, uh, noticed in the integrated rate of heat release, which is uh, this curve here on the lower right uh, corner. Same thing can be observed in the engine tests. Uh, if you look at the gas pressure, this is shown for three injection timings, minus 2.2 and minus 0.3 and 1.8. If you start with the early injection, you'll find that the, the match is very good. As you go to later injection, where the temperature is lower, there is some discrepancy, but still it is acceptable as being good, a good simulation. The same trend follows in the rate of heat release the mass gas average temperature, but look at the injection lead need left, it fits very well. So here they have good, good uh, uh, simulation. Uh, this is the uh, engine out emissions and, uh, and the ignition delay. On the, on the right hand side, the ignition delay matches fairly well at uh, the early and the very late injection. Well, in fact, it matches fairly well in the three cases and it can be considered a good simulation. On the right-hand side, you'll sign, find that the NOx and CO and hydrocarbons match very well, and the problem is in the particulate matter, where the variation can be from 30%, 56%, and we look into why this is happening, and you recall that in the distillation curve, we have this part where there is quite a deviation between the two at the heavy end. The surrogate has a much lighter components than, uh, than the JP8, and this is why the particulate emissions in JP8 show fairly high number compared to the surrogate. Uh, this is the comparison between the measured uh, emissions and ignition delay for the surrogate and JP8 and the simulation. The simulation is shown in green. You, saw, you see that on the left-hand side, you can say that there is some deviation which varies from plus 7%, minus 15%. It means that the mechanism has to be refined a little bit in order to, 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 to make these changes much lower. If you look at the right engine out emissions, at start to injection, which is late, you see there is almost a perfect match or very close match in the simulated versus the measured. And there is some differences in, uh, uh, under, uh, under other conditions. And it shows that there, there, needs, there should be some tuning of the, uh, of the surrogate itself. Finally, we can arrive at this conclusion. The experimental investigation on the single cylinder <coughs> diesel engine showed a good match between JP8 and the surrogate except for the particulate matter. Additional investigation and fine tuning of the simplified mechanism will be made before its application in production engines. And the two component surrogate mechanism is limited to JP8 of good quality, and those some modifications can be applied to commercial engines operating ultra low sulfur diesel fuel. Last but not least, the AP8 of lower C10 numbers, such as Sassel IPK, requires surrogates with more than two components. This is the end of my presentation here. Thank you, Professor Hanin. So, as Professor Hanin mentioned, um, to be able to, to characterize the wide range of fuel properties within the, the Army's inventory, uh, with the surrogate, we need to transcend beyond a binary mixture of fuels. 
for the surrogate and uh, open that up to a broader range of, of species essentially within our surrogate pellet. So what the next several presenters will focus on is the development of our fuel surrogate uh, via numerical optimization and also experiments that we're performing for validation. So the focus here will be on the surrogate fuel itself. So the methodology that we're, we're using to formulate our surrogates, as I said, is based upon optimization via computers and validation with experiments. So we're using a, a range of experiments within this work, including uh, optical engines whoops, uh, from Professor Janssen's, uh, metal engines from Professor Hameen, uh, and also Professor Bayman, in addition to the IQT uh, used both by Wayne State uh, professors. So essentially, these experiments then, we're, we're generating data uh, to assess the, the performance of the surrogate fuel relative to the target fuel itself. <clears throat> So metrics that we're using for this assessment include liquid penetration lengths of the spray jet, the PDFs of species that are critical to the high and low temperature ignition processes, so formaldehyde for low temperature ignition, hydroxyl for high temperature. We're also assessing the ignition delay through a, a variety of devices. Uh, Professor Bamian is looking in particular at low temperature heat release from a CFR engine. And finally, we're also assessing the performance of the, the surrogate fuel relative to the uh, the actual target fuel within all of these devices. And so we come to the conclusion of these experiments and we ask the question, are these metrics, are they acceptably matched or not? And so if they are acceptable, then we have what we feel is a validated surrogate. However, if not, then we have a feedback loop now where we can go back to the optimizer or we can go back to the experiments and blend up new surrogate compositions. So uh, Professor Janssen's will actually detail part of this iterative process that we're using. <clears throat> so, <coughs> we're surrogating currently three target fuels, Jet A, IPK, which is isoparaffinic kerosene, and S8. And as you can see, these fuels have a very wide range of CTN numbers. So the autoignition process uh, of each fuel will be very, very different within a given engine. And so this can be challenging when you need to cold start an engine or just in general start the engine when the engine hasn't been designed uh, either mechanically for that that fuel or through, say, for example, a control system. And so this is a challenge for the Army. Now, uh, the optimizer itself, it's based on a genetic algorithm. Uh, we're taking now thermodynamic relations and also correlations for the, the surrogate properties as a function of composition and temperature in some cases. So in essence, we're, we're taking these, these surrogates that we're mixing up and based upon properties such as CT number, lower heating value, the H to C ratio of the fuel, its molecular weight. Those are all temperature independent properties or temperature dependent ones, such as density, viscosity, surface tension, and also the distillation characteristics. We now have these, these correlations or thermodynamic relations where we can actually compare how we think the, the surrogate will behave relative to the target fuel itself. And so <clears throat> then in essence, once we've uh, defined the surrogate mixture composition, the candidate, we pass that on to the experiments for, for further assessment. So what we're looking at here is the actual surrogate palette that we've selected for, for this work. Now, the key thing about the surrogate is, is this needs to go into CFD. So not only do we need to know what species are being used within CFD, but we also have to know the chemistry associated with those species. So it's the chicken and the egg problem, right? You need a chemical mechanism that works and you also need the composition that works with that mechanism that by the way can reproduce the characteristics of the target fuel, your real fuel. <clears throat> so we've, we've selected uh, six components for our surrogate palette uh, that we're using to emulate the target properties of our jet fuel. <clears throat> so, and Professor Violi will describe that mechanism here uh, shortly that we're, we're currently using in this work. So <clears throat> what we have are our six species. So these species include normal alkane, so endotocane, endecane, isoalkane, such as isocetane, an octane, cycloalkane, uh, decalin, and also an aromatic toluene. And as you can see, we're, we're showing now the DCNs for each one of these fuels, and there's a, a very wide range of, of DCNs that we have available to us, essentially encompassing what the real fuels show. And so having this wide range of properties, we can now arrange through optimization the surrogate composition so that we can replicate the properties of our, our target or real fuel. So what we're showing here then is now the, the three fuels of interest that we're surrogating, IPK, Jet 8, this is POSF 4658, and S8. We're showing the volume fractions then of each one of these, these uh, neat hydrocarbon species that we're using within the surrogate. 
And what you can note is, is that for each one of these fuels, we have a wide range of volume percentages for each of the components that are necessary to replicate the real fuel properties. Uh, in general, we have a, a fairly good match, I'm going to say here. So this match is within plus or minus 5% for our temperature independent properties. Again, these properties are CTA number, the lower heating value of the fuel, its H to C ratio, and also the molecular weight. <laughs> so just highlighting, for example, the CTA number, which is one of the real, real problems. Again, the, the auto ignition of these fuels is a challenge for the Army. And you can see that we have a, a fairly good match for these. <clears throat> uh, another novel feature of our surrogate is our ability to capture the temperature dependent properties for military fuels. So I'm showing two slides here now uh, uh, with various properties as a function of temperature. The first is density. And what we can see is the, the solid lines, this is our Jet A surrogate in red, followed by IPK in blue and S8 in black. The symbols are the experimental properties that we're comparing to. And we have a pretty good match overall for the, uh, the density characteristics. This is very important for liquid length penetration, for example. If you want to get that right uh, it, within your simulation, then this is one of the properties that we need to match. <coughs> so we can see that the RMS error for, for the density is, is essentially it's within 0.6% for all of the fuels. Uh, viscosity, shown on the right, uh, a similar level of agreement, roughly 4% RMS error. Uh, and I'm not showing the distillation curves, these are pretty complicated, but essentially we're doing a good job for Jet A and S8 uh, within 2% RMS errors. However, we have a 7% RMS error now for IPK. So some additional work may need to be done to uh, further refine the surrogate in order to capture the distillation characteristics. <clears throat> okay, so once we have these, these surrogates now that we develop from optimization, the next step then is to pass them to experiments for more validation and assessment, whether or not we can match the, 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 the characteristics of the target fuel experimentally. Uh, so Professor Bayman will, will be up next, uh, and in his talk he's going to describe some of the chemical validation that he's performing on a CFR engine. Thank you, Jason. So uh, our role in this team is to explore the chemical behavior of the surrogates. Uh, particularly look at low temperature heat release, uh, but overall ignition process as well, and a motored CFR engine. Uh, and what that allows us to do is decouple the physical and the chemical behavior of the fuel and do a direct comparison between the target fuel and the surrogate uh, in terms of its chemical ignition behavior. So we remove the spray and vaporization processes and get direct insights on the auto ignition process with this tool. And what we want to look at then is, is a particular phase of the temporal process of diesel spray, vaporization, and auto ignition. And Professor Violi earlier had a cartoon that showed the spray flame, the mixing control process. What we have here, again, from work from Sandia, Musculus et al., uh, is this temporal set of cartoons for the spray ignition process. Over here, we see the needle lift, we see the heat release process. These are the crank angle degrees that match the figures. And what we want to look at is a particular phase of these where the fuel has been injected, it has vaporized, it's mixed with air, and it begins to react. That's the part of the process we want to look at, and we do that in the motored engine by sending in premixed fuel and air and just watching the auto ignition process. So in reality, as Professor Janssen is going to tell you more about, we could, could look at the physics and the chemistry. We're assuming that we're past this injection, vaporization, and mixing process and are just looking at the auto ignition which is a multi-phase process in terms of the chemistry. Initially, there's going to be some low temperature heat release. These are uh, uh, oxidative reactions on the fuel molecule that don't release much heat. Then we typically transition for hydrocarbons that exhibit a two-stage ignition. The reactions actually slow down. That's referred to as the negative temperature coefficient domain. Uh, and then finally, we have the second stage ignition, which is the full auto ignition. So overall, this would represent the ignition delay period, the time between mixing and preparation of the mixture and the auto ignition. And we're going to be able to look at the details of this chemistry with the motored engine. Okay. So what we can do with this is look at things like criticality in the ignition process. In this plot, we see carbon monoxide, which is a marker for the decomposition of the fuel, versus compression ratio. With the motored CFR octane rating engine with the twist of a knob, you vary the compression ratio, changing the, the relative height of the cylinder head versus the block. 
And so we can march up in compression ratio until the CO t uh, uh, tips over and the CO2, shown here in red, takes off. That's ignition. And we can see this process in stages as it happens as we vary compression ratio uh, at a given mixture fraction of fuel and air. Uh, or we could vary the equivalence ratio, the, the ratio of fuel to air, while we hold compression ratio constant. And again, we see a criticality as, as shown here in carbon monoxide. So these are two yardsticks for judging the autoignition chemistry of the fuel. And if we have this as a description of the surrogate and for the target fuel, we can make a very detailed comparison of their autoignition chemistry and whether the surrogate properly captures the combination of the low temperature heat release, NTC, and high temperature heat release behavior. So we can look at how much of the energy was released in the low temperature phase. What is the overall combustion phasing? We can get all these details as well as look at the products of combustion and partial oxidation to match the two fuels. So with this, we can get a, a, a highlight the autoignition chemistry and then leave it for other experiments uh, to uh, gauge the physics. So our tool is over in a test cell in the auto lab. It's our CFR octane rating engine. It has a modified intake system that allows us to heat air with or without diluents and other compounds and then spray in fuel uh, the fuel vaporizes, mixes with the air, and then is ingested by the engine, and we work our way up in compression ratio or mixture fraction to get ignition. Uh, we can collect the exhaust and do detailed chemical analysis, and the way I like to show this is imagine N-heptane as an example. What pathways is it following at a given regime of the autoignition chemistry? And we can see that by doing product analysis, collecting the products of combustion and doing detailed chemical analyses on them. So the fuels that we've looked at thus far are the nominal Jet A fuel, the target fuel for which the U of M surrogate has been designed so far, uh, and two other jet fuels uh, that are representative of JP8s. Um, these are all samples obtained from uh, the uh, fuels branch of uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And what we see is they, these three nominal jet fuels have a similar cetane number, but different compositions. So we expect some variation in their autoignition chemistry, but they should be fairly consistent in the way they behave. And the key question is, does the surrogate capture the behavior of the target fuel? And secondarily, how does it compare to these other fuels? So what we've done is we've done individual analyses of the components that make up the palette of fuels that comprise the surrogate. And we see here a comparison uh, looking at heat release as a function of crank angles. This is one autoignition process that we're watching as the engine is rotating. And we see that the, the different uh, components in the surrogate compared. And we'll just pick out the two extremes. Here, endodecane is operating at an intake temperature of 260C and a compression ratio of 5, and you see it's gone through the full two-stage ignition. Endodecane is really reactive. At 260C, but a compression ratio of 12, toluene has hardly done anything. So it's at the other end of the spectrum, very low ignition quality. And so the different components that make up the surrogate allow us to create a blend that will capture the behavior of a wide variety of jet fuels, as Dr. March just mentioned. So endodecane is the reactive component, toluene is the unreactive component, and with this mixture we can represent the autoignition behavior of the jet fuel. Here we've got four of the individual components that comprise the surrogate, uh, critical compression ratio and critical equivalence ratio results, and again we see endodecane is reacting at the lowest compression ratio, generating lots of CO, a sign of high reactivity, Toluene is at, at, at the extreme at the other end. Uh, it takes a lot to get toluene to autoignite. In terms of critical equivalence ratio, fuels that are more reactive will react at low equivalence ratio and low compression ratio. Endodecane here is the most reactive. And so we see here the range of reactivities of the fuels of interest. And together then, this allows us to blend to form a representation of the jet fuel. And by way of results, uh, we have these data from uh, my student, Donggil Kang. Uh, here, we're comparing the target fuel, the surrogate, and along with it, the two other jet fuels to see how similar they are in terms of their behavior. Here, we have critical compression ratio results at three different equivalence ratios, critical equivalence ratio results at three different compression ratios. And we just want to highlight that uh, there's very good agreement in terms of these critical ignition behaviors for the target fuel and the surrogate in both cases of critical compression ratio and critical equivalence ratio. Uh, and so from these results, preliminarily, we've concluded that 
the surrogate very well represents the, uh, the uh, behavior of this target fuel. And our continuing work will be to explore the reaction pathways, to look at other conditions, and to also look at some of the alternative jet fuels over the coming year. So with that, I'll hand it over to Professor Janssens. Thank you, Andre. Well, Professor Bayman uh, well illustrated uh, the properties of individual components of the surrogate pellet and of jet fuel are markedly different. So when we mix these simple compounds together in a surrogate mixture, their interaction is complex and can be highly nonlinear. Therefore, it is very important that we perform experimental validation in practical combustion systems at temperature and pressure conditions representing what would be encountered in a production or military engine. So hypothetically, what if a proposed surrogate behaves differently in an engine than the target fuel? Is it because the physical properties are different? Is it because the low temperature kinetics are different? Or is it because the high temperature kinetics are different? Well, by applying an optical engine and optical diagnostics, we're able to examine the details of the combustion process that takes place on a time scale of less than uh, a few milliseconds. And uh, uh, what we're able to do is provide feedback to uh, the surrogate optimization group uh, to improve targets that need uh, better representation within a surrogate. So for those of you maybe not familiar with an optical engine, uh, it comprises a hollow cylinder which is affixed to the traditional slider crank mechanism. By the insertion of a stationary mirror into a cutaway wall of that cylinder and by mounting a transparent window into the top of that piston, we are able to obtain optical access into that combusting volume. Additionally, by mounting windows in the sides of that cylinder, we can introduce laser sheets to freeze spray behavior, or to freeze the spray. Similarly, we can attach, uh, or we can insert a uh, window in the cylinder head to observe the combusting volume from the top. In this manner, this device allows us uninterrupted observation of the combustion process over the full four strokes of that engine cycle. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, the, the, the artwork that Mark Musculus was kind enough to share with us. Um, uh, but to give you an idea of the types of optical diagnostics that we're able to perform to interrogate this very short time scale event, uh, an example of uh, a diagnostic which interrogates the physical part of this process, the spray, is a measurement of liquid penetration length. The next diagnostic that we considered is uh, broadband ultraviolet chemiluminescence. This is a, uh, given off by formaldehyde, which is a marker for first, first stage ignition and low temperature heat release. Second stage ignition, kernels, is typically marked by the presence of hydroxyl radical, which can be identified by narrow band filtering of UV signals at 309 nanometers. Likewise, soot and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon distribution can be observed through natural luminescence imaging. The autoignition quality of various iterations of the surrogate were measured with an ignition quality testing machine. By providing the optimization team with data not only on the iterations of the surrogates but on the derived cetane number of the pure compounds, we are very quickly able to zero in on the derived cetane number of the target fuel. And I have to acknowledge the six-year Army veteran, Doug Harriman, currently engineering student, uh, who is ably doing these experiments. Um, so as we see here, we are able to achieve the target DCN number within 0.2 points, well below the experimental uncertainty of the device. Liquid lengths. So by uh, illuminating the diesel spray with a laser pulse, of about seven nanosecond duration, we're able to freeze the spray. Second order spatial derivative defines the boundaries of the liquid. We are able to come up with a penetration length over the course of the spray event, in this case, probably about five crank angle degrees. Notice that the red line and the blue line are nearly superimposed on each other. This is how well the surrogate is representing the penetration length of the target Jet A fuel. This is the case for the Jet A and its surrogate. Similarly, 
for the Sasol IPK, uh, its surrogate is also very well represented in terms of liquid length penetration. I would also like to accentuate that the black line in both of those curves represents the penetration length of n-heptane, which as Professor Hanin mentioned, is often used as a surrogate, and the glaring difference in a penetration length uh, perhaps indicates that uh, we can do a better job, and I think the surrogate that we have here uh, uh, certainly does so. Probability density functions of formaldehyde chemiluminescence taken over a range of engine crank angles. Formaldehyde is a marker for first stage ignition. It is a marker for low temperature heat release. And the observation here is that the surrogate well represents the temporal and spatial evolution of formaldehyde over a range of crank angles. Hydroxyl chemiluminescence. This is a marker for ignition, high temperature ignition. A comparison of chemiluminescence images taken of the surrogate in comparison to uh, the target jet A fuel over identical engine conditions yields the conclusion that we also have very well matched temporal and spatial distribution of the ignition, ignition kernels. So now that we've matched up the events on a local scale, physical and kinetic, we can look at the global heat release rates or global cylinder uh, pressure traces. And what I'm going to show you is uh, cylinder pressures or cylinder traces taken uh, spanning temperatures of about 830 to 1000 degrees Kelvin at the time of fuel injection and pressures ranging from about 35 to 60 bars. In this uh, experimental envelope we see that the low, at the low temperature and high pressure uh, extreme we see that the surrogate very well matches the profile of the target fuel. At the other extreme, high temperature, high pressure, we see the same result. The lower left hand corner, low temperature, low pressure, the match is very good. And at the high temperature, low pressure case, the match is still good. So over a temperature range of about 830 to 1000 degrees Kelvin, um, in a pressure range between 35 to 60 bars, the surrogate appears, this is the Jet A surrogate, it appears to very well match the target fuel in terms of ignition delay, combustion phasing, and combustion duration. And uh, future work involves uh, repeating the same process for uh, the Sasol IPK and the SA. A lot of experiments. But um, so the point is that we were able to um, create a framework of modeling an experiment that basically um, allow us to um, come up with a surrogate for J JP8. So let me move one step forward now. Remember that our goal is to model an engine. So now for JP8, I want to show you the roadmap that we have been following to get to that point. So the fuel, we talked about this. So we talked about the surrogate. Now that we have uh, uh, the surrogate, how do we build all the way up to a CFD, but still retaining information on the fundamentals? So what I'm going to show you is uh, some simulation that we've been doing, uh, uh, starting from really how the, uh, the molecule looks like, and slowly building on complexity, looking at the dynamics, and then a mechanism. Meaning, if you take a molecule and you place high temperature, high pressure, how this molecule is going to break up? What is the oxidation? What kind of byproduct are formed? So, um, Jason showed this. We were able to create a palette of simply six compounds that can reproduce the uh, physical and chemical property of the fuels. Not everything, but the majority of the most important ones. And um, we have validated surrogate for Jet A. We're working on IPK and I say it um, also for, uh, for the chemistry. So once you have this molecule, what do you do? You need to see to start thinking how they can break up and react. So we assembled a mechanism that basically is a list of all the possible reactions that can happen once you have this molecule in a combustion environment. And you can see four major classes of compounds, alkane, isoalkane, uh, cyclic, and aromatic. All those need to be taken into account to come up with um, a mechanism, a list of reactions. And so far, we have 5,000 species and almost 23,000 reactions, huge. So what have we done? The first thing we need to know is if this is correct. 
so we um, turned to shock tubes to look at ignition delay. So what I'm showing here is uh, uh, on the left the ignition delay in measuring a shock tube versus temperature for jet A with an equivalent pressure of 1 at 20 atmosphere and here uh, a 1.5 uh, equivalent pressure. Hopefully it's only that noise, nothing has happened. Okay, so um, that's, 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 the, that's scary. Okay. So we do a good job. So if we talk about Jet A in those conditions, 20 atmosphere, the, our modeling does a pretty good job uh, to reproduce the experimental data. So what we did is basically now, in order to feed this information to SFD, you have to reduce the thousand of reactions. So we did that, and we come up with a skeletal mechanism, so a reduced number of reaction of species, and we started some simulation of a CFD, so a dodecane, one of the species in our surrogate, how it's going to behave in an engine, um, with, and some results are here with the CFD simulations. The important point is that um, what you want to see here is that the ignition, so what are the conditions where the ignition starts? So for example, very rich condition for one, uh, between one and two are our key parameters if we want to uh, be able to develop the model. So, but so far so good. But we have a lot to still a uh, lot of work to do. So let me show you if I change the pressure. So as you know, the engine has a very high pressure. So we are not doing a great job here, especially when you see this kind of a curving behavior, what they call NTC. Professor Bayman just talked about this. So the reactivity of the fuel changes with temperature. And so we need to do improvement in the uh, high pressure regime for jet fuels. If I change fuel and I'm still at the low pressure, um, I also have discrepancy, so there is a huge need for improving the chemistry. Now the question is, how good do you want to be? How good is good? And so here I'm showing that if I have a three millisecond uh, disagreement between the experiments and the modeling, that corresponds to 32.4 uh, crack angle or at 1800 RPM. So still significant, something that we need to address to move forward towards a predictive model. So if I have to summarize what uh, the whole team has uh, presented right now, so we have a, a framework that is computational and experimental. So there's a synergy between uh, all the team members, and we are able to look at surrogate that can reproduce the physical and the chemical properties of real uh, fuel. We also have uh, something unique that is the temperature dependence of some of the property in the surrogate. The JP8 has been validated with different experiments. You heard the different presentations. There's still a lot of work that needs to be done for IPK, S8, and the blends. One thing I want to highlight is that we are all, is an interdisciplinary team. So we have people who do molecules, and, uh, but also people that can do um, experimental lab scale tests as well as engine. So we are able to somehow cover from the fundamentals all the way to the applied uh, um, chemistry and physics of the system. What are the needs and future direction that we want to highlight? So chemistry needs to be improved. Uh, we are not doing a great job um, for all the the broad range of property and species that we would like to cover. CFD simulation needs to be improved in terms of what are the models for spray, atomization, and other parameters. Experiments are still required because uh, oh, we, as you can show, I showed from the simulations, we need the different pressure, temperature regimes, as well as equivalence ratio. So at the end, we want a model that is able to predict the behavior in a wide range of conditions, environmental conditions. But I want to show you also one thing. We recognize the limitation, but we also have ideas, not only for the experiments, as uh, all the previous speaker um, showed, but also for the chemistry. So I just want to show you something that people have been currently using and also we presented. So you have the fuel, usually you develop this huge mechanism, as we did, 33,000 reactions. And then eventually you simplify because you need to do it to a CFD code. While you take all the steps, you're making errors, you're making simplifications. And this is the reason why I could tell that currently there is no mechanism that is very good um, at reproducing uh, fuels. So what we're thinking about is a new approach that we would like to pursue in the future, that basically you go from the fuel to a reduced model. So the point is that we know how to move forward, and uh, we are very excited about all those results. 
Now, the last slide is that um, how those predictive models can help the Army. And so here I have a roadmap showing that uh, surrogate fuel, so for JP-8, but also you know, for uh, APK S-8. And once we have a model for that, then that could be used for CFD simulation to predict the behavior in an engine. And this has an impact not only on the control that could have for those engines, but also for uh, um, the future. So for a joint development of fuels and engines together for the engine to be able to adapt to different scenarios. We know fundamentally from automotive that there should be some benefits, but how do we show that and how, what can we do with it and does it apply in a military environment?